Diamond realized that Yali's question was far bigger and more complex than it first appeared. It was really about the roots of inequality. A question as old as human history itself. Why, since ancient times, have some societies progressed faster than others? What allowed the Egyptians to build great pyramids while most of the world was still scratching out a living? How did the Greeks ever develop such an advanced civilization? Or the Romans? Or the Maya? All great civilizations have had some things in common. Advanced technology, large populations, and a well-organized workforce. If I could understand how those things came into existence, then I'd understand why some people march faster than others during the course of history. Diamond set out to explore the division of the world into haves and have-nots. It was a massive challenge that few scholars would have dared take on. He was a scientist, not a historian. How could he possibly solve the great puzzles of human history? To understand where inequality came from, Diamond needed to identify a time before inequality, when people across the world were living more or less the same way. He had to turn back the clock thousands of years, back before the first civilizations, back into prehistory. Thirteen thousand years ago, the ravages of the last ice age were over. The world was becoming warmer and wetter. One area where humans were thriving was the Middle East. Thirteen thousand years ago, the Middle East was far less arid than today, with more forests, trees, and plants. People here lived like people everywhere at this time, as hunter-gatherers in small, mobile groups. They were frequently on the move, making shelters wherever they could find animals to hunt or plants to gather. They'd live in these shelters for weeks or months at a time, as long as they could keep feeding themselves. But as seasons changed and animals migrated, they'd move on to the next valley or ridge looking for new sources of food. One of the few places on Earth where it's still possible to find people hunting and gathering is the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. Yeah. Instead of just reading about this lifestyle in archaeological books, I've been lucky enough to witness it firsthand, to see for myself how we all lived 13,000 years ago, and how we found food. To catch an animal requires skill, stealth, and encyclopedic knowledge about hundreds of animal species. You have to be pretty smart to be a hunter. Thirteen thousand years ago, people in the Middle East hunted in the same way, tracking down whatever game they could find. But the fundamental problem with hunting is that it's never been a productive way to find enough food. It takes time to track each animal. And with a bow and arrow, there's no certainty of how the hunt will end. 
one of something. <laughs> you know can lap. You try and get it. Okay. Pull him. Mm. Okay. Uh. One time more. Yes. <laughs> One so time you pull him strong. Me pull him strong. Yeah, me. Yeah, you pull him strong and by go more yet. Yeah. Me, me play broken ball. Broken no, one, God, yeah, you're not strong. And <laughs> <laughs> you're not strong, yeah. Me no strong. What a So you pull him strong. Time All right, me, go me pull yet. him strong. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 Me pay to one fella, Divai. Divai died in us. <laughs> you number one, me number two. Me try, me go, we go, we go. Because hunting is so unpredictable, traditional societies have usually relied more on gathering. In this part of Papua New Guinea, the gathering is done by women. An important source of food here is wild sago. By stripping a sago tree, they can get to the pulp at the center, which can be turned into a dough and then cooked. Although it's physically harder work, Gathering is generally a more productive way of finding food than hunting. But it still doesn't provide enough calories to support a large population. This jungle around us, you might think it's a cornucopia, but it isn't. Most of these trees in the jungle don't yield, don't give us anything edible. There are just a few sago trees, and the rest of these trees don't yield anything that we could eat. And then sago itself has got limitations. One tree yields only maybe about 70 pounds of sago. It takes them three or four days to process that tree. So it's a lot of work really for not a great deal of food. Plus the sago starch is low on protein. And also the sago can't be stored for a long time. And that's why hunter-gatherer populations are so sparse. If you want to feed a lot of people, you've got to find a different food supply. You've got to find a really productive environment, and it's not going to be a sago swamp. In the Middle East, there were very different plants to gather. Growing wild between the trees were two cereal grasses, barley and wheat far more plentiful and nutritious than sago. These simple grasses would have a profound impact, setting humanity on a course towards modern civilization. But it would take a catastrophic change in the climate before this would happen. Twelve and a half thousand years ago, the world's climate became highly volatile. The long-term thaw that had brought about the end of the last ice age suddenly went into reverse. Global temperatures dropped and ice age conditions returned. The world became colder and drier. The Middle East suffered an environmental collapse animal herds died off. So did many trees and plants. The drought lasted for more than a thousand years. People were forced to travel farther and look much harder to find any source of food. But despite the conditions, they would somehow survive and even prosper. Here in the Middle East, a new way of life would come into being, one that would change the face of the earth. <laughs> 